My branch of service is U.S. Navy. The wars I served in is World War II. My highest rank uh, was a radium in third class. The interviewers are Scotty Springston, Don Byers, and Carrie Wren, Cameron Sound, Barbara Dorr, and Marlene Waters. Well, thanks very much, <clears throat> Jim, for coming in and doing this. Uh, uh, as you know, all of the uh, master tapes are sent up to the Library of Congress <clears throat> where they will store them and take good care of them. But let me start off. Number one is usually our, uh, our questions about your response and what you thought about when you heard about Pearl Harbor. Well, how old were you at that time? I was... Um I think I was 17 years old and 41, let's see, I was uh, 17 or 18. And you were in high school at that time? I, was, I had just finished high school in June before December. Well, how did you hear about it? <clears throat> well, we came home from church that Sunday and my father turned the radio on and we heard it on the radio. And it was a shock. Nobody knew where Pearl Harbor was, really. And it was quite a surprise for everybody. Uh, did, what did you think about it, what it meant for you? Now, you're just about to graduate from high school. Well, I don't remember any details of how I felt how it would affect me. I guess I was too naive to know <laughs> What, uh, what it was going to affect me with. But as time went on, I realized that uh, everybody would be affected. And where was your home at that time, and uh, what kind of work were you doing when you got out of high school? My home at that time was in Graham, North Carolina. Um, I worked with my father in the grocery store. I had a mom and pop's grocery store, and I worked with him in the grocery store. Uh, what about you in the draft? When did that happen? Or did it come along? Yes, I was drafted in 1943. I happened to be working at the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics as a model maker in Newport News. I lived in Newport News, Virginia. I worked at Langley uh, as a model maker. And I was working there about a year before I got my draft notice. And where did you, <clears throat> uh, where did you get signed up, and uh, how did it progress from there? Well, we, uh, I went back to Graham, and they put me on a bus, and a busload of us went down to Fort Bragg to be inducted into the Army. When I got to the Army desk, the uh, I guess it was sergeant said. The Army is full today, so you're going to have to select the Marines or the Navy across the room there. So I went across the room and selected the Navy. Uh, what did you think of it at that time? Did you, were you particularly inclined one way or the other? I didn't know much about what I would do in either case, so I, I selected the Navy. And from where, where did you go from there? Well. After selecting the Navy, I had to go to Raleigh the following week to be inducted into the Navy. And then uh, they sent me to Great Lakes Naval Training Station in, in Illinois. And I was up there for about, I don't know, six weeks or so training in boot camp. What were your impressions of the <clears throat> transition from civilian life to military life at that time? It was different. <laughs> uh, we had to do things according to the rules and regulations, and we had to get used to that. But I remember I didn't really object to it. I uh, kind of enjoyed, enjoyed the marching and so forth. And I sang in the choir at the Great Lakes Naval Training Station. I enjoyed it. 
And from there, the, you, you got sent to some kind of a specialist training school, did you? We were sent to a radio training school at Auburn, Alabama. There, we learned the Morse code, uh, voice communication, and some uh, technical characteristics of radios. Have you followed that up at all? Not really. Okay. Uh, how long were you there at the uh, in, in Auburn? I was um, 19 years old. And how long was the course? I think it was about five months. How much How much Morse code did you have to be able to copy? Do you remember? I was typing. Uh, we use it. Uh, took typing and uh, took Morse code with the typewriter. And I took 19 words a minute. That, that, was that, that was probably a little more than you had to do? What was I that? don't remember what we had to do, but I could type faster, I'd take code faster with plain language than I could with code, I remember. But I don't know the, the difference in numbers. And uh, we'll, we'll go ahead a little bit. At that time, were they using Morse code in the fleet and when you got to the fleet? There was in the fleet, but when I, the ship I was assigned to was a small landing craft, and we used uh, voice communication mostly. And from, uh, you, you got some additional training in Long Island, New York? Where, what yes, that? we went to Long Island. I think I was just a waiting game to uh, you know, wait for our ship in New York to be ready to sail. and. We did do some semaphore training with the flags at that point. I think the whole crew got involved with semaphore training. Uh, any weapons training at that point? No, no, no weapons. So you were about ready to head off. To, where did you go from there? Well, we went down to Pier 92 in, in New York to uh, wait there until our ship was ready to sail. And that was about two weeks there. And I think you said there were, there were some other troops, troops from other countries at that point, weren't yeah, there? Yeah, I remember some British sailors were there in that uh, huge complex. Pier 92 was just a transit station, I guess, for sailors going and coming. And at that point, did you know where you were headed? No. Uh, wh wh uh, what kind of a transport were you on uh, for the trip? Our LCT was loaded aboard a LST in uh, pieces, uh, and we got aboard the LST and uh, transported ourselves with that. Uh, so you made the trip in an LST? As part of ship's company, yes, so, from, from LST. From New, from New York to uh, San Diego. Okay. How long did that take? One month. Through the canal? Through the canal. And uh, <clears throat> did you run into any rough weather, any problems on that trip in the Atlantic? The Atlantic was nice and smooth. I enjoyed that trip. How about once you got through the canal? Once we got through the canal and started up the Pacific side to San Diego, it was very rough. And as a matter of fact, we had a uh, escort, sub-chaser, I think it was called, escort, and they had to pull into Albu Albuquerque, um, Mexico, to get repairs. Alapoco, what, what is it? Uh, Acapulco? Acapulco, yeah, and they to get repairs. Uh, what, was, what were the repairs for? I don't know. They were beat up quite a bit in the uh, storm, oh. high seas. And, uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't easy trip up the uh, Pacific? I, I was seasick. <laughs> A lot. How about the rest of the crew? I think some of the others were seasick also. Uh, I don't remember that much detail, but I know I was seasick. Uh, how fast would that <clears throat> LST go? Ten knots. <clears throat> Wide open. If the seas were calm. Right, yeah. Uh, from there, you went to San Diego, and what did you do in San Diego? 
did nothing really. Um, we were there about five days waiting uh, to sail to Pearl Harbor. I guess with uh, some other ships, we all got together and went in as a convoy to Pearl. And you were still in the LST? Yes. On the way to Hawaii? Right. Okay. How, how big a ship is an LST? It's about 300 feet long. Uh, it's a pretty good sized ship, but it has a flat bottom. And it rolls, yaws, and pitches and with the swells and the waves and so forth. So could they serve you hot food? I guess they could when it was calm. But well, they always served hot food, yes. But go, 10 days to, from San Diego to Pearl, uh, I was seasick the whole 10 days. Uh, did you have any medical attention at that point? I don't think so. I don't remember any. None for the seasickness? No. So how did you handle that? Did you just stay in the sack? I just didn't eat. I went to the fantail and fed the sheep, uh, uh, fish and, and just didn't eat as, not as normal. <laughs> so when you got the pearl, how long did it take you to recover, first of all? Well, you recover pretty fast. I did. Once you stop rolling and pitching and so forth and get on dry land or stay still a while, it, I recovered pretty fast. So what was your main job at that point? Well, our LCT was offloaded from the LST. We were in three pieces and uh, we had to put the ship together. Our little LCT had to put it together. Uh, I wasn't part of the crew that bolted the thing together, but I understand we had big bolts and bolted the bulkheads together and we had a ship. And what was an LCT? What was the main job? LCT, uh, our main job was to offload the merchant ships and take supplies into the beach. Whatever was needed to go to the beach, we took it in. How big was it? About 110 feet long. And the deck was, it was an open deck, and you could, uh, tanks, for example, we had some tanks aboard at times, and they would uh, we'd go up on the beach, the ramp in the front would drop, and the tanks would roll off on dry land or whatever. Uh, at that point, you knew you were headed somewhere, I guess, into the Pacific. Again, you, did you know where? No. We, we didn't. Uh, we left Pearl Harbor about March of uh, 44, I think, and uh, went to the Philippines. But it took us a long time to get to the Philippines. We stopped at one island or two on the way and accumulated more ships as we went along. And in the Philippines, we stayed there about a month didn't get off the boat or anything. We just sat there in the harbor for a month. And then from there, we went up to Okinawa. Uh, what was happening at that time at Okinawa? The invasion was uh, uh, April 1st, 1945. And we were, I guess we were in the Philippines when the invasion started. So you knew you were headed to some, uh, some action at that point? I don't know if I knew or not, but uh, once we left Philippines, we knew we were going to Okinawa. What were your feelings at that point about the possibility of being near combat at least? Well, I don't know that uh, we really had any strong feelings one way or the other. We were anxious to do our job. And uh, you, you had mentioned that, uh, was it on the way to Okinawa that uh, you were attacked by some aircraft? No. Um, once we got to Okinawa, they had air raids every night, or maybe sometime in the daytime too, 
and they'd make smoke. The ships in the harbor make smoke, and we would cast off from a merchant ship if we were offloading uh, supplies and go out and anchor and wait till the air raid was over and then go back and start our job again. Maybe it was when you were in the Philippines there was a, a friendlies, I think. Oh, on the way to the Philippines, our skipper wanted to save the flag and not wear it out, so he didn't fly it. And uh, an SBD, Dauntless, spotted our ship along with others and didn't see any identification, so he asked for identification by buzzing the ship and nothing happened. So then he fired a few bursts across the bow and uh, that got their attention. He decided to fly the flag at that time. And it, it was in pretty good shape, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> uh, let's get back to Okinawa. Uh, and as I understand, the, <clears throat> you landed or you, you run, it, run it up on the beach and drop the ramp and off come the trucks and the tanks. You're following up on the invasion force at that point, aren't you? We were supplying the Marines on the beach, yes. And uh, what was the enemy action at that time? We could, um, you could hear the rifle fire on the, uh, ahead of us on the beach. And um, we never did see any, uh, I saw some Japanese uh, prisoners, or just a few, there wasn't many. And a lot of dead on the beach. But we took in a lot of supplies to the beach and we would go up on the coral reef at high tide and anchor, and then when the tide went out, they would come out with trucks and unload our ship and take the supplies into the beach. And so at they, night, if, if we were still on the beach, so we got uh, shelled by Japanese guns up in the hills. They didn't hit us, fortunately. So you, your boat didn't get hit at all? No. Okay. And uh, that was short, how long uh, was that campaign? In other words, how long were you involved in getting supplies to the Marines on the, on the island? Well, we arrived there uh, middle of May, and we took supplies into the beach for the duration uh, of the war. I think that was, what, middle of August, around the 1st of September. And we were still there after the war was over and uh, continued to do the same thing because there were no piers for the big ships to come in. So the Marines had to get some food and other supplies some way. And yes. Kept, okay. Uh, what was your reaction when you heard of, uh, first of all, how did you hear about the end of the war? I guess we heard over there, we had a little civilian type radio. And of course, everybody knew when the war was over. And uh, we were in Buckner Bay at that time. And every gun in the harbor was uh, firing the tracers into the sky. The sky was full of tracer bullets. We had two 20 millimeter guns on our ship. We're not allowed to fire, even in air raids. We're not allowed to shoot those. But during the uh, celebration, they went off. We shot those guns. Uh, I, I presume you were allowed to fire the guns if you were attacked in any way. Is that correct? I'm not sure. I, I wasn't a gunner's mate. I didn't fire the guns. I wasn't involved in that. But I was just told we're not f allowed to fire the guns. Uh, did you hear about uh, how the war ended, that is, the atomic bomb? Yes, were we knew were? that. Uh, what were your <clears throat> thoughts about it at that point? We were very happy because our ship and flotilla was scheduled to go into the invasion of uh, Japan and within just a few months. I don't know the details, but that's what I was told. And I was happy to know that, that we didn't have to do that. Uh, were you beginning to count your points toward... Uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, you, the next next event, when, when was the next big event in your naval career? 
Well, about two weeks after the war was over, we were in a bay north of uh, Buckner Bay. I think it was called Shimawan Bay, uh, but I'm not sure. I, I, I haven't seen any reference to that. And uh, we were tied up to a pontoon-type pier with two-inch hawsers, and they began to snap and break because the wind and the waves were got so strong. And the uh, LCT next to us said the uh, typhoon was coming. And we were to cast off and go into an anchorage on the other side of the bay. So we went over there. It was d still dark. It was after sunset. And we went over there, and we had the center hatch off of the center engine, I guess, for months prior to that. In the Philippines, it was hot, and they took the hatch off. And it was warped such that it could not be put back on airtight or watertight. And during the storm, the uh, water came over the fantail and started filling up the engine room. The bilge pumps could not take care of the water, and the ship began to sink lower and lower in the water. And by daybreak, almost half the ship fantail was underwater, and uh, about 6 o'clock in the morning, it uh, just lunged and went straight up, and everybody had to abandon ship quickly. How did you do that? How did you abandon ship? I just, uh, I was on the ramp. The ramp was down up front in the bow. I just jumped. I, now, how far was it down to the water? It seemed like a long way at the time. <laughs> it's probably 20 feet or 30 feet or so because the bow had been rising and the ship was sinking and going straight up in the air. So, uh, and I had to pause a little bit before I jumped because the ship was loaded with wooden crates. And uh, some one guy didn't jump in time and he slid down the deck when the deck the ship started rising and broke his leg. And two people were cramped, uh, got uh, stopped or crushed with a ramp closed when the ship went straight up. The ramp closed and caught them and crushed them. How many people were crewing this LCT? There's 17. 17. And you had sleeping quarters on board and everything? Oh, yes. We had sleeping quarters, a galley. The smallest ship in the Navy, I think, where people lived aboard. So how was, at that time, at that time, the water was pretty rough, of course, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Um, um, I've washed up into an area where there was a coral cliff, and uh, I was banged up against that cliff with the high waves and swells. And with the, my life jacket on, that's the only way I survived, because the water would swell and it bang me against the cliff, and it would disappear, and I would drop back down under the water again. I was underwater half the time, I thought, and I knew I was going to die. I just, there was no way I could get out of that situation. But then uh, the current or something washed me over to a crevice in the cliff, and I grabbed the hold of a twig or, and pulled myself up out of the water. Well, that cliff was Carl, of course. That was sharp, wasn't it? Sharp Carl. Yes, my hands were cut up and my forehead was cut. Once you got, finally got the grip and, and got on land, I guess you don't know how you actually got on land at that point. No, I, I didn't realize I, I was in shallow water. I was under water half the time. The water was real deep. And then suddenly I felt my feet touch the bottom. And I realized I was in a place where I could pull up and get out. And what happened then? I pulled myself up out of the water and, and laid down and and thank the Lord that he had saved me. And I promised to work for the Lord the rest of my life. I was a Christian before I went in the Navy, and uh, I have kept my promise to the Lord to do that. 
So you, you, how badly were you injured at that point? You were, could still get around pretty well. Yeah, I could walk. Um, they took me across the bay the next day. Well, well how did uh, how did you find anybody, or anybody find you at that? Point? I went up. There was a little island there. We were anchored off to and uh, close to, and that little island where I washed up. I went up, and there was a tent up there with a few people living in it. They survived the storm. Went up and told them a ship had sank and they needed, we needed help down on the beach. And I don't remember how I got from there to get help, but uh, somehow they got me in, uh, put me on a stretcher and took me across the bay the next day to a hospital. And they took you by ship across the bay? And the LCVP. A little landing craft. Right now, you might hold that chart up so we could get a picture of the location. Now that's the island of Okinawa, and you mm. put a little mark right there. This is about can where. You, can you put that straight mm -hmm. to the hold it straight to the camera if you can? That's that's good. And where was your ship located? This mark here is about where we were located. That cross. Okay, so you, which way was the storm coming from at that point? It was coming from the Pacific. Okay. This so is the Pacific, and the water was wind and rain was coming this way. So theoretically, you were in the lee of that little island. Yes. Where it should have been relatively calm. But I understand the wind was about 130 miles an hour. It was a pretty severe typhoon. And, uh, So, um, so what? From that point on, they transported you to a hospital, a field hospital. Yeah, we went to a, a hospital on Okinawa. Uh, I had lost everything. I didn't have any clothes, no shoes, nothing, and uh, my hands were cut up so bad I couldn't handle anything, and my forehead was still have a scar there. That's uh, where I was beat up against a coral reef. And I was in the hospital about a week to uh, repair, get uh, repairs, so to speak, from the wounds and healing. And uh, obviously the typhoon had uh, damaged a lot more than just your ship at that point. Did you have any knowledge of what, uh, what else had been damaged? I don't remember at, uh, at that point, but two weeks later another typhoon struck the island. And that was a stronger typhoon. And I was ashore in a tent at that time. We went up the hill and I rode out the typhoon in a cave. And after the typhoon passed, we walked around the island. And the merchant ship we found uh, 100 feet from the beach up in dry land. There were seaplanes scattered all over the bushes and trees and the around the perimeter of the, of the uh, Buckner Bay. There was a lot of damage. Uh, was that your last, uh, the last hospital uh, time there in Okinawa? Well, until I was discharged. Oh. I needed to get glasses, so they sent me to the Portsmouth Hospital to get a pair of glasses. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, you healed up pretty well. Oh, yeah. And you were reasonably happy to get discharged. Oh yeah, <laughs> I was ready. And where where was that? Uh, where did you get this? Where, where did you come from uh, from Okinawa? Where did they transport you to? Well, I think it was about uh, April. I was able to get a ship that was going to uh, Norfolk from Okinawa, and I was part of ship's company again. And uh, I stood radio watch all the way back from Okinawa through the canal and up to Norfolk. And at uh, Norfolk, the, I went to Little Creek to get discharged. Uh, during the exam, they found that I needed glasses. Of course, my glasses and everything else were lost when the ship sank. 
So I went to the, they sent me to the Portsmouth Naval Hospital to get glasses. That took a week. And I finally went back and got my discharge on May 10th, 19, 1946. And uh, you had mentioned that at that time that you, everybody got discharged counseling. It was pretty good. Was that yes, I had counseling at that time. I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer. And uh, I talked to the counsel at that time, and he recommended very strong that I go to North Carolina State. He said, it's right there at your hometown almost, and they have a good engineering school. So after I got discharged, I applied to North Carolina State, and that's where I went. And you got your degree in aeronautical engineering? Yes. Technically, it was mechanical engineering, aero option. And, uh, but it was uh, aeronautical engineering is what I went into. And after you graduated, what did you do? I um, applied to uh, work at the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, where I had worked before as a model maker and went back there and worked as an engineer. Yeah. So you were still involved with models? Yes. As a matter of fact, when I was there in 1942, I built models and worked with models in the spin tunnel. So when I went back in 1946, uh, 1951, that's when I finished college, I was assigned to the spin tunnel again. And uh, I knew some of the people I had remembered before particularly in the model shop I worked with. I presume that you got some uh, help with, uh, from the uh, GI Bill on the education. Oh, yes. All of five years. <laughs> um, when I went to college, my high school did not prepare me for college, really. So when I got to NC State, from the test I had to take, I found I was lacking in several things, so they taught me that at State to get me ready for college. So I, they taught me the courses, gave me the courses I needed, and when I finished that, I just entered full college courses. At that time, there were a lot of, is it, uh, were there a lot of other veterans in the school? Out of the 5,000 people there, I think I knew two or three people who were not veterans. Everybody was a veteran. Uh, other, uh, other of our uh, the veterans have told us that they thought the GI Bill was one of the best things that ever happened. It was wonderful. It was a godsend. And I think this nation really was uh, blessed by the people who came back and went to college and went out into industry from there. As a matter of fact, later this month, I'm not in November, NC State is having a, a GI Bill Remembrance Ceremony, and I'm going down to uh, participate in that. And that's in North Carolina State? Yes, uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina. In Raleigh. Well, let me ask you kind of a sum it up uh, of all your military experience in World War II to any one, uh, of course, the uh, getting off the... Uh, ship when it sank was probably the highlight of your Navy career. Is there anything, any other uh, event or uh, happening that you remember, remember most? Yes, the one uh, combat experience I remember. We were beached on uh, near the combat zone at Okinawa, and we had uh, a deck full of uh, five-gallon cans of gasoline. Thousands of them, I would think. Lots of gasoline. And the Marines could not come out at the proper time because of the tide before dark to unload the ship. They would drive trucks out and take these uh, cans of gasoline and haul them out. Well, they couldn't do that after we beached because of the tide was tide situation. So we had to sit there all night. And they told us, says, um, if I were you, I'd come ashore. I wouldn't stay in this thing tonight. Because up on the hill there, the Japs roll out the guns, and they'll be firing at you. 
And sure enough, they did. They didn't hit us. I heard shrapnel falling on the decks, but they didn't hit us in a direct hit. So we didn't get much sleep that night. But you were off the ship then? No, we, we stayed, stayed aboard with... the ship. We, couldn't, we didn't uh, abandon the ship. So if one shell had landed on that deck... That would have been it, yeah. Oh, I been guess. the final. Well, is there anything else, anything you'd like to add before we wrap it up? No, I don't know of anything. I've covered about everything I can remember. But I appreciate the, the effort that a lot of people have put in a program like this to save our history. Scotty, anything else? No, thank you very much, Jim. We appreciate you coming and talking to us. It's my pleasure. All right, very good. Well, good. Yeah, thank you. I well, can't imagine that, being out there in that. I've, I've been to Okinawa. I've spent a lot of time on Okinawa. Yeah, I know exactly where you're talking about. But uh, I can't imagine. I would have thought you'd have gone on the other side of it to get, get away from on the straight side rather than be out on the We didn't side. have time. Oh, okay. The storm was on us before we knew it. Communications at that time was uh, yeah. poor. Our flagship was in Buckner Bay, and we were on the other side of the island. And just our little radios, voice communication was very sparse and we, hard to keep uh, communication. And we didn't know the storm was coming until it was on us. Until it was there. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been a long ways around. Probably would have been 40, 50 miles to go off. Oh, yeah, we couldn't go around in time to get so, back anyway. How, you said those hawsers were separating. How big were they? The two inch hawsers. Two inch, yeah. They were snapping on the little LCT. Sure. Now, we, um, we did pull in the Naha Harbor during the yeah. time that they were fighting there. And Naha itself was a pile of stones. There's one little tiny building standing. Everything else was just level. And they, they told me it was Naha, but there was nothing there but just a pile of stones. Well, it's a booming city right now. It is. Yes. <laughs> it's hard to believe that uh, that place is uh, developed like it is. Yeah, they tell me I was.